OK, it's been about three minutes waiting for folks to log on. Um, we will continue to allow people in through the remainder of the meeting. Um, again, I'm going to ask that if you're not a speaker today, if you could please turn your cameras off just so that it could be a bit easier for our speakers um, and everybody that's a guest to be focused in on them and the presentations going on on hand. Welcome everybody to this installment of the S3 meeting. Um, if you're not familiar with the Sustainability Speaker Series, it is a free service run out of the Bureau of Sustainability at the NJDEP. We changed topically to focus on different elements of sustainability. Today we're going to be talking about building efficiency and how to make sure that you're in a green building. We have two experts with us today. William Emmen from M&E Engineers, and then also Ken Levinston from Passive House. If you're not sure what Passive House is, I will not take away from his presentation because that is part of what he will be explaining to you today. Again, a reminder, please keep your mics off. Um, you can type any questions that you have during the presentations into the chat box. You can see um, right at the top of your screen, there is a chat icon. You can click in that type in your questions as we go as to not interrupt our presenters and then I will go ahead and I will read a few after each presentation to get those answered and then at the end of both presentations there will be an opportunity for you to turn your camera on um, and also turn your microphone on if you would like to ask your question out loud to try to simulate um, that in-person experience that we miss out on a bit with doing these uh, virtual meetings. Um, if you're not comfortable doing that, you can still obviously use the chat box option and then I will go ahead and read your question to our presenters. So first up, we do have Ken, again, executive director from Passive House. He graduated from Pratt Institute with a Bachelor of Architecture, and after practicing architecture for 20 years in New York City, discovered Passive House in 2009. Without further ado, I will now pass it over to Ken. Ken, you seem to be muted. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> nope, it is that. perfectly fine. Apologies. Uh, thank you, Gina, and uh, good to be with you. Good to be uh, with Bill uh, with our presentations today. Nice to see some familiar faces out there coming in. I think some of this may uh, be familiar, but it's always good to have a little repetition, I think, and, and look forward to the, the Q&A and uh, lots of new people. So let's get started with why Passive House um, or an introduction to Passive House. And first, just let me note that the Passive House Network is a nonprofit a national nonprofit. We have regional uh, chapters is with with the chapter in New Jersey. So if you're interested in following this, we'd love to hook you up with our, our regional members. We are affiliated with the Passive House Institute in Darmstadt, Germany, and part of an international Passive House movement uh, where lots going on in China and Korea to New Zealand, the UK, all around the world, uh, Canada and the US, of course. So we're really focused on education, uh, public education, but also professional education and capacity building uh, so that we can move towards a, a decarbonized and low energy future. Um, so let's begin briefly, um, set the context. In short, the buildings are super important, right? And they're generally failing us, and especially given the fact that we spend over 90% of our time indoors. Uh, buildings account for 40% plus of global carbon emissions, a giant proportion. You, building utility costs are generally too high and rising. <laughs> Energy insecurity is only growing. Buildings are often unhealthy and are making us sicker and poorer as a consequence and great driving greater social inequity, um, really a root of it. Buildings can be unsafe when the power goes out and we're seeing that in more and more instances of extreme weather. So we know we need to change things. We need to make our buildings uh, more sustainable, but sustainability we find is kind of like a green Rorschach inkblot test, we'd say. Uh, it means different things to different people and different folks have different priorities. And I'm excited uh, 
with with Bill's conversation coming up as well on aspects of electrification and building systems and how that that works in and passive house works well with that and I think we'll see that um, but also across a, a wider array of of um, priorities from historic preservation which you may not necessarily think net zero energy to environmental and social justice affordability it's Important to note that Passive House, although the name seems to indicate that it's for single family homes, which it certainly can be used for, is actually any type of building. And we see a broad variety from factories to uh, university buildings, affordable housing, an office building tower going up in downtown Boston today. So Passive House, um, so part of the power of it is the simplicity of the concept and really boiling it down. Um, a lot of folks, once you hear and you go through these this presentation, they'll be you'll be like, well, it's kind of just basic building science, right? And that's true. Uh, but in the um, approach of the, the the rigorous targets and the methodology to get there kind of sets it apart. And one of the things that does set it, up is the simplicity of its initial concept. And so what we're trying to do is, and sorry for all these words here, but um, rather than read it this time, I'm just going to say typically we see efficiency and things like comfort and health working against each other, right? Um, you know, the sad news with, uh, with Jimmy Carter going into hospice, um, he, you know, famously said, put on a sweater, right? Uh, back in the day when we needed to turn down the thermostat and save energy. Um, and so where Passive House comes in is it looks at efficiency in a way that actually drives comfort. It drives indoor health and aligns these things so they're both supporting each other. Also, basic building science, but in terms of the emphasis and the driving um, philosophy is really core to it. Um, so Passive House is the world's most rigorous building energy efficiency standard. Um, and from this kernel of energy efficiency, we see it supporting a wide range of goals. In terms of the efficiency, you could think of it literally in a Passive House, if the power goes out in the middle of winter, you can stay comfortable and safe by lighting some candles. Um, not that we want people to be heating with candles, but in those rare instances, um, that is possible. A hairdryer is another metaphor for uh, the heating load of a passive house. And what we see is uh, in this graph is typical leaky buildings um, where we have um, heat losses below this line at zero um, here and, uh, and so we've got heat losses here, and then we've got heat gains above the line. And the solar and internal will make up some of the heat, but we really need a big active heating system. Our more modern houses do a better job of cutting the heat losses, um, and so they require less active heating. But Passive House really looks to push the envelope as the driver of performance, and we can really crank that down. So we're looking for 90% reduction in heating energy, and about a 75% reduction in the uh, systems involved. So when I was architect practicing, some big houses that we were working on uh, for some first adopters, as you could imagine, the, the typical home of their neighbor would have 12 tons of air conditioning. Uh, we calculated a 90% reduction, it needed a ton and a half of, of cooling um, and heating. As a, as a peak demand. And so we installed a, a system that was 75% uh, smaller at about three tons. So dramatic reduction in the heating and cooling systems. And then we can electrify, uh, we can use heat pumps, we can um, uh, use renewable energy much more effectively. Part of the power of Passive House is the uh, fixed targets, that they are very specific and they're not relative to improvement. We're talking about generally going 75, 90%, but there are specific numbers that you're hitting 
regarding air tightness, heating, cooling to humidification, and overall energy use intensity. And this helps lock in a level of performance. There are multiple certification levels, um, a classic, if you will, and then higher levels of performance that start to incorporate renewable energy strategies and higher levels of building performance. It also can be used for retrofits. And it is a, a topic that everyone's very interested in, especially for our homes. Retrofits are tricky uh, and renovations are tricky. We look at them um, and the passive house philosophy is really um, to plan the renovation over the life of your occupancy and do things in sequential ways because you may not be able to do them all at once and to do each step of the way at a very high level of quality, a passive house quality. So when you're done through the cycle of upgrading your building, you have a passive house performance at the end of the day. So it's as much about planning as the actual execution in a way. So this focus on the fundamentals and on specific targets allows the passive house standard to deliver much more predictable results. And one can imagine you want predictable results because that allows you to optimize the mechanical systems. Uh, my clients were spending a couple of million dollars renovating their home. It was a townhouse in Brooklyn Heights. Um, and, uh, you know, it makes one nervous when you're putting in three tons of air conditioning when all their neighbors have 12 to 15 tons. You want to be sure it's going to work. Um, and so the methodology speaks to that. And really it's because it's scientifically based and developed. Um, the first passive house, modern passive house was completed in 1990 as a physics experiment in Darmstadt, Germany. It's four row houses. So the first passive house was really an apartment building, we would say, uh, or you know, a, a, a block of flats, um, and uh, pass house really grew out of social housing and multifamily housing. But again, we do apply it to all types of buildings. This was an experiment. A lot of the components didn't exist then. The windows, the, 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 the heat recovery levels that they were looking for in ventilation. Um, and they really achieved a super high performance building. The story goes that Amory Lovins from the Rocky Mountain Institute showed up and was very excited and was like, this could be... Uh, this could be standardized, this could be scaled, this could be industrialized and have an effect on the market. And from that time, they codified the standards and have been developing uh, the standards and the applications across uses, across climates around the world um, in, in, uh, in its application and continue to do research today. There are, um, five key principles to Passive House. Uh, it's obviously more complicated than this, but really starts with this integrated methodology. And I'll go into this a bit more, but to first say, it starts with insulation, climate-specific insulation. It's like a sleeping bag, right? Um, thermal bridge-free construction, which we'll go into um, because we don't want breaks in the insulation. We want to have high-performance windows and doors that are uh, part of the continuity of the thermal insulation, as well as the air tightness. Ah, air tightness was two, I, I went around the wrong direction. So air tightness, like insulation, needs to be continuous. And we'll talk about that. And there's often questions about that. And then high efficiency heat recovery ventilation, uh, which I'm glad to see Bill touch on as well following this. Um, critically important to maintaining uh, high quality indoor air. Now you can use natural ventilation strategies with Passive House. We just can't depend on them all the time, right? When it's really hot out and muggy, or if it's really cold, or if there's just air pollution and out West where you have forest fires uh, significantly, sometimes you just have to have the place buttoned up. You wanna have good indoor air quality, no matter what the outdoor conditions are. So that sets you up for low energy building. So let's go through this a little bit more. Continuous insulation, like I said, climate specific, like a climate rated sleeping bag. You're, it's going to vary in the easy climates for in Southern California, not much insulation. Um, as we head into Canada and the Arctic, you're going to have quite a bit. We want to maintain 
the interior environment. So it takes those handful of candles to heat the inside in those worst conditions. Air tightness. Um, and really the thing about air tightness is it's such a driver of, of energy losses, um, optimizing the insulation and, uh, and maintaining control over that indoor air so you can maintain a high level of indoor air quality. Think of the air tightness as a windbreaker, um, you know, in combination with a sweater or fleece uh, that really allows that insulation to do its work and to maintain uh, comfortable temperatures. Thermal bridge free construction. So at the joints between the floors and the walls where you have structure going through, uh, different aspects. Um, typical construction is loaded with thermal bridges and it's totally degrading the level of insulation and the performance of the building. Typically, these buildings are not rigorously calculating. Uh, typic in typical construction, folks aren't rigorously calculating the thermal bridges. And so you need to oversize the mechanical systems. You need to compensate because you just don't know where you're, you're landing um, so specifically. So we really try to dial that in and either eliminate them or uh, calculate them and put them in the energy model um, after minimizing them. So, you know, typical old uh, historic building, which is poorly insulated, and you have thermal bridges of various kinds where the, the building is a radiator to the world and then buttoned up where that insulation is continuous on the right. High performance windows and doors, and we also want to have good uh, solar protection. So people do equate or think of in the same breath passive house with passive solar housing. There are similarities for sure. Uh, we are using some solar heat gains here, but solar heat gains are not driving uh, the performance of the building in the way that passive solar houses are. We're very conscious of trying to maintain balance and not overheat through overglazing and not having lose control of the glazing uh, and, the, and the heat. So we wanna have the shading when, when it's needed and we wanna let in those solar heat gains when needed. They're often triple pane, they're airtight, and the installation is very rigorously done to maintain that continuity. We want to be able to use the space, all the space comfortably. So we don't have radiators under these windows here um, and, the, and the air conditioning does not need to be pulled to the perimeter because the space has much more continuity in terms of thermal comfort. The window, the glass on that window is not that far off the wall temperature um, and the other surfaces. So a lot of a lot of things going on there to maintain uh, comfort. Also acoustically the windows because they are uh, so robust it knocks the, the noise down. Um, it, when you're in a noisy environment whether it's in the city or in the country um, it really gives you a sense of peace and quiet. The fresh air uh, ventilation with efficiency, efficient heat recovery. Um, so we want to supply clean fresh air to all the served spaces, the bedrooms, living rooms, the classrooms, the offices, the conference rooms, et cetera, and exhaust through the served uh, service spaces, um, the, the bathrooms, the kitchens, the the utility closets, the hallways, if you will. And we're doing a layout um, through the whole building. We're balancing the ventilation. So what is being supplied is being offset by the exhaust. So we're not pressurizing or depressurizing the enclosure of the building. Um, and we're filtering the air. And the heat recovery is at a level, uh, it can vary, it's at least 75% overall heat recovery. The unit should be operating at higher than 75% heat recovery. The units now, we see over 90% heat recovery, uh, counterflow heat exchangers, and um, and this allows you to provide fresh air with without um, adding heat to them in the winter or cooling in the summer. So we're creating interior environments where you know you have less asthma, there's less mold, there's less allergy reactions uh, because of the, the quality of the indoor air. So these five principles essentially are 
put into the energy model, which is a very, it's a simplified energy model based on decades of research, based on dynamic modeling, but then they just kind of simplify it to make it much more easy to calculate. And out comes the other side, your design, it's part of the design tool, um, seeing how different levels of performance for different aspects, orientation, sizes, qualities, and we want to get that 90% reduction in heat demand. That's what we're kind of gunning for for a overall um, uh, 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 performance metric. Um, it is specific number, 4.75 kilobtus per square foot per year, but it translates to that to that relative number. Um, so. Uh, Essentially, just a quick note on the predictability issue. So on code, the buildings are kind of all over the place in terms of the energy use. Um, and you know, you could have a really good building, but the code certainly isn't driving that. And it's really dependent on the folks. Lead Buildings is a great example that has wide benefits of sustainability and is a great program. And they can be very energy efficient, but Lead as a program doesn't dial in on the energy efficiency quite uh, as robustly, not nearly as robustly as Passive House does. Passive House focuses on the energy. Um, you're going to have a little bit of variation, but it's just a little bit of variation. Um, and so you have that confidence in going forward. You know, use patterns, people operate, you know, buildings live differently, work differently, but it should be relatively tight. A quick note on cost. Um, cost, the, the, and we can come back to this. The, the, on this graph on the left, the black dots represent um, conventional construction and the blue dots represent passive house construction for multifamily housing in Pennsylvania, part of the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency program over three years. It shows, the graph actually shows the passive house overall costing less than conventional construction. Um, and that is certainly possible, but I wouldn't sell it as costing less because it, it is high quality construction. Um, but the fundamental point is that based on the scattered dot pattern of this graph, there is no direct correlation between passive house and costs. And what we realize is there are, are a lot of drivers of costs and projects. And it's really about managing the costs, the cost drivers and optimizing uh, with Passive House from day one. Don't add it at the tail end of the project. It needs to be programmed in early. Um, the team needs to be trained properly and we need to stick to optimization and certification. The certification process can actually help um, control costs um, in clarifying you know, what, the, what the boundaries are. So, as we started with the talk, it supports a wide range of goals uh, with fundamental benefits. So again, back to supporting health and well-being, we're reducing um, poor building performance. Comfort, which we covered with that other slide, both, um, both acoustic and thermal comfort. Um, resilience, security, and equity. We see passive house being applied a lot in um, affordable housing, and it's really good in terms of driving down those operational energy costs as well. Obviously, the utilities have those service fees that you can't get rid of, but the actual uh, KBTUs, we can dramatically reduce them. And um, in this building, this is a senior housing in Queens, New York, on the ground floor is a pre-K uh, occupancy. Um, so having, having those uh, variety of uses can be quite important as well. Policymakers are pushing towards, you know, where, where the, the political environment um, is strong in terms of climate. Uh, they've made a budget, a carbon budget. They know buildings are a significant part of that carbon budget and, and the policymakers are looking for solutions and Passive House is a, is a strong way to help policymakers deliver on their, on their carbon reduction goals. Supporting electrification of renewables, as we push to electrify, the best thing that we can do um, in terms of a more flexible, robust and affordable transition 
is use less energy in the first place. Um, less renewables on site, less renewables on the grid. If we can avoid, as we electrify and all this, these buildings are coming onto the grid that weren't there before in ways um, for heating and cool, or for heating in particular, um, if we can avoid raising the peak heating demand in winter when we have the worst uh, renewable production, uh, it can do a lot to save the utilities big money. We're trying to, to, to figure out how to get the utilities mm -hmm to recognize this more robustly. And certainly in places, um, NYSERDA in New York has programs, Mass Save in Massachusetts is ramping up, but it's still early days. And to support the urgency of embodied carbon. So embodied carbon is a whole other talk, but it's, a, it's about the emissions that go into making the building in the first place. And then the maintenance and replacement costs of the building, like you know making the doors, pouring the concrete, the steel, the glass, all of that is creating carbon emissions. Now, in a typical building, the operational emissions are through the roof. And so nobody's thinking all that hard about embodied carbon, but as we push down operational emissions, embodied carbon becomes the 300 pound elephant uh, in the corner and, or gorilla, I think is the right metaphor. And, um, and so, uh, we want to deal with that. And a wide range of UN sustainability goals. So I'll just finish up here with a couple of um, remarks uh, that, it, you know, it makes us think and work differently. It gives us new expectations about our how our buildings can operate. And just a note, a call out here that um, all of you are on this call probably because you care. Uh, you want to make change happen and you're active in your communities in one way or another. And so in speaking with about Passive House and just learning about it or maybe a little bit more about it, uh, to just actively think about it is, is what we'd like to see. Enter into the conversation, into uh, where your communities are thinking about it. If you're renovating or building new, whether it's personally or your company, to think about Passive House. Um, we see large success in local sustainability groups, green groups, um, demanding of developers that they go for uh, more rigorous targets. And this is a big project in Newton, Massachusetts that's under construction and Green Newton really demanded the developer step it up and, and pushed for Passive House to the developer's credit. They did agree to it. And um, if under duress, I would say they not only agreed to it, but they've embraced it. And beyond uh, the initial uh, commitment to Passive House buildings, they've actually expanded the Passive House portfolio within the project uh, because they see the benefits to what they're doing. Um, and if you uh, know folks, the training and education in terms of capacity building is so important. We want to build a healthy, equitable, and sustainable world, and we feel Passive House can really help transform the status quo. So thank you. That is the end of my presentation, and I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Ken. That was great. Um, so far, we only have one question in the chat. As a reminder to everybody on the call, um, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat. I will then read them aloud. Um, and then at the very end of the meeting, if you wish, you can turn on your camera and turn on your mic, and then you can ask questions uh, that way to try to simulate um, that networking experience that we get at in-person events. So first up, Ken, we do have a question from Zach Goodwin. Um, he says he understands early iterations of Passive House were actually attributed to mold issues. And then he asks, is that true? And if so, you know, he assumes that it would be addressed in later iterations. I mean, there's a great, um, yeah, there's sort of a mythology around Passive House, perhaps, and a, um, um, I don't know, various stories that may be coming through second, third, fourth hand. Uh, typically what we see um, in passive house building, like what we end up seeing is in passive house building, um, it's construction, right? And 
like all construction, it's not a perfect environment <laughs> and things can happen. Um, where I won't say there, you know, there have never been any issues with passive house, but I don't see it as being um, pervasive or indicative of passive house construction. Um, typically, what we've seen in typical construction where they've put up vapor barriers and insulated and not ventilated properly, you have like the state of Maryland is one big mold bomb um, by all by all accounts. Um, and uh, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but um, what we see is, is uh, buildings are complicated things. So I, I have no doubt that there's been passive houses that have had, you know, things come up with difficulty, but certainly not in a pervasive or indicative way. Okay, great. Uh, Chris Schmidt asks a two-part question. Uh, the one says, can you explain the difference between lead and passive house? I'm just going to start off with that because I think that's a loaded enough question as it is. Yeah, and I don't think, I mean, it's it's an impossible thing to answer in a way. I, I would just simply say, and maybe Bill has a thought on this, is lead is is much broader. It has a much wider sustainability focus and has done a lot of great things in terms of moving the market in a, in a way, um, in many ways. Passive house is very narrowly focused. Um, and what we see is, is that narrow focus being using that as a benefit, as a good characteristic, and that and it can support a wide range of sustainability goals, but they're not required that wide range uh, where the, the lead really is, sp uh, you know, spelling it out. Okay, great. The second part of Chris's question was, are there examples of historic preservation that addresses renewable energy? For example, historic windows, doors, roofs, heating systems, and how were they preserved historically while creating renewable energy? Yeah, so, well, um, I would say Passive House has been applied to many historic buildings at this point, both uh, wood frame, but mostly masonry kind of of the, you know, uh, in Brownstone, Brooklyn, uh, Brownstone, New York, uh, there are many, many, many passive houses at this point. It's not, my, my first project was a pre-Civil War uh, building that we brought up to passive house levels. Um, and you can, um, the windows that have been developed and the approaches that have been developed, you can maintain the historic character of the building. Passive house is generally a very deep intervention into the building. So you may have to reconstruct things, you know, you may need to um, rethink, you know, the ultimate expression of the building, but you can, you can put it back, let's put it that way, um, and, and do it with some success, a, a lot of success. The University of Cambridge in the UK, its new sustainability center uh, is in a historic masonry building, and they for a wide range of sustainability things, and they did it to a certified Enerfit, the passive, certified passive house standard, as a marker of their sort of forward thinking. Um, so, you know, renewables, it, it's actually kind of interesting because passive house, if it's done well, you look at a building and you probably couldn't tell it was a passive house just at first glance. You would have to know what to look for and how to look for it because you don't need to put solar panels on the roof. You don't need to have certain exterior things. So, you know, the renewables question, we would tackle, you know, last, important, but drive down the energy use, get the maximum energy efficiency, and then, and then add the renewables. Great, great, thanks, Ken. Um, even though we are running a little bit ahead of schedule, which is great, I'm still just going to ask one more question for now to Ken before we move over to Bill, just for sake of keeping this flowing. Um, but we will address again all of the remaining questions in the chat box at the end of the meeting. Um, for now, just one more question for Ken. How does Passive House fit into IRA and HERS scores to maximize rebates and incentives? Yeah, it's well, it will be interesting to see how the, the, the IRA programs develop. Um, right now, it's 
you, you know, I, from what I understand is, it is the tax uh, incentives um, and and rebates. There are a handful that are, are available, and certainly passive house would qualify for them. But there, it's not unique to passive house. It's not like passive house is written into the IRA uh, language. Um, and we have what will become more interesting, perhaps, will be as the states get their buckets of money, and they write their rules and for just you know distribution of it. Um, right. Yeah. So we're we're cautiously optimistic. All right. Thank you so much, Ken. Again, we'll get to the rest of your questions towards the end. Next up, we have William Aman, president of M and E. I've been told that my accent makes that sound like I'm saying anemone and things like that. So letter M and letter E, engineers. He's an expert in both mechanical and electrical engineering and has over 35 years of experience in energy systems. He is a licensed professional energy engineer and one of just four individuals in New Jersey to be distinguished as a lead fellow. Without further ado, I will pass it on over to Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Gina, and uh, thanks, Ken, for an uh, excellent setup. Um, it's uh, these two seemingly different topics uh, align really, really well. So let me uh, get my screen set up here. And I think this will work once I start it up. All right, Gina, are we seeing that? It is a black screen for me, unfortunately. I don't know if anybody else uh, can see the presentation just yet. Yeah, not yet. Okay, mm. thanks, Ken. What I'm sharing. So right now you're sharing uh, a copy of the like the teams. So it seems like you just needed to share a different box. Mm -hmm. uh, you were sharing the team screen. If need be, I could always pull up the presentation as well because I have the copy on my end and then I could advance the slides for you. All right. Um, how about perfect. that? Yep, okay. it just needs to be put in presenter mode and we're good to go. All right, good. There we go. Perfect. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so um, thanks for the for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about Building efficiency is Ken has really done a good job of, um, but then once we make the thermal envelope uh, really efficient, we want to talk about how we're going to heat and cool it. Um, and not every building can achieve the you know the amazing EUIs that a, that a new passive house can do. Um, so uh, we still are going to need um, heat pumps. Um, and systems in, in a lot of buildings. So what I want to cover today are just some basic heat pump fundamentals. Um, I'm going to talk about air source heat pumps, um, including an especially cold climate heat pumps. Um, I'm going to talk about water source heat pumps. Um, they're mostly for commercial use, but those are also what we use for what we call ground coupling or geothermal. Um, Geothermal can be closed loop, uh, which is what most people are familiar with, uh, but there's also open loop geothermal, which is one of my favorites, um, extremely efficient. And I guess going to touch briefly on the outside air ventilation uh, that Ken mentioned about that's very important within um, Passive House and, and any, any uh, highly efficient building. Um, so in the building sector, um, as Ken said, you know, reducing energy use has all sorts of benefits. Uh, 
Uh, and as I've said many, many times, and will continue to say many, many times, the best kilowatt hour, the cheapest kilowatt hour, the most environmentally friendly kilowatt hour is the one we never use. So efficiency is absolutely the number one uh, priority. Uh, but uh, we uh, we end up we we do need to use energy. Um, another attribute is the indoor air quality. Uh, when we when I started doing this back in 1979 during the energy crisis, um, we tightened up buildings. We created sick building syndrome. So that that was not a not a good way to to do this. So um, we're much more cognizant of the need for uh, indoor air quality. And then lastly, decarbonization. Uh, we know that carbon dioxide and methane from fossil fuels are causing global warming, uh, which in turn is causing these weather whiplash events, which we're seeing more and more often and are going to get worse. Uh, so we really can't do a carbon offset for uh, fossil fuels, but we can produce clean electricity. So that's why electrification is really important. So let's talk about heat pump fundamentals. Um, some people say heat pump is not a good name for a heat pump. Well, I think it's a great name because um, heat pumps pump energy from one place to another. Um, and uh, they follow the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. All we can do is move it from place to place. And when we do this with a heat pump, we um, we measure the amount of energy we can move as a, a ratio of the useful heat movement um, compared to the energy input. That's called the coefficient of performance. And in this case, it's maybe a little blurry, but we put one unit of energy into the heat pump, we get four units of energy out. Uh, that is 300% uh, efficiency. That is um, quite, quite useful. Uh, the way the heat pump works, a heat pump is just the same as an air conditioner, um, except that it has a reversing valve. Um, so an air conditioner takes heat from your house and rejects it to the outside. A heat pump is, does the same thing, except in winter, the reversing valve activates and we take heat from the outside and pump it to the inside. Uh, and again, we can pump, we can take heat from the outside and pump it in, we put one unit of energy in, we get four out. It's um, it's extremely efficient. Uh, so like I said, we pump energy from one place to another and uh, the reversing valve uh, just reverses the refrigerant flow. Um, these are refrigerant devices. Um, <clears throat> how well or efficiently heat pump can work as a function of the thermal lift. Most air conditioners and heat pumps use the Carnot refrigeration cycle to move the energy from one part of the system to the other. Um, it's a re re reversible isothermal gas expansion process. Um, first is proposed by the French physicist Sadi Carnot in 1824. Um, so the efficiency is, is a function of the lift. And as you can see in the winter time, uh, take a typical winter temperature around here of 30 degrees. We've have an indoor space of 70 degrees, we have a 40 degree delta. Um, whereas in the summer, uh, we're trying to maintain 75 inside, 95 out, we've got a 20 degree delta. And this is the key to the efficiency of these different types of units. Now, uh, old style or conventional heat pumps um, really didn't work well or stopped working altogether below 30, 35 degrees, at some point they would stop working. So they have a bad reputation because uh, most of the ones that were installed in the 70s and 80s uh, and 90s, um, and when it gets really cold out, they switch to electric resistance heat, um, which is quite expensive. Um, it's, you know, it has an efficiency of 100%, but you're paying 100% of the electricity. Uh, you end up with a very big electric bill in uh, in January and February. Uh, so those were not popular. Um, but we now have uh, cold climate heat pumps. Um, in 2007, Mitsubishi introduced their hyperheat system. Um, the hyperheat um, system is, and, and there are others, um, 
is a cold climate air source heat pump. Uh, other manufacturers include Daikin, LG, uh, Fujitsu, Sanyo. Um, and what's great about these is uh, they use new technology of variable speed or and or variable flow refrigerant uh, control. And most of them or a lot of them have 100% heat capacity down to five degrees. So we're eliminating the electric resistance heat in that cold weather. Um, and if you're worried about them continuing to work, um, they actually work down to uh, minus 13 degrees. They're losing some of their capacity, uh, but they continue to work. Uh, there is a great resource if you want to find information on these is the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership or NEEP. Uh, you can go to NEEP, N-E-E-P dot org, uh, and they've got an amazing database of all the various types of systems, manufacturers, et cetera, and what their um, capabilities and capacities are. Um, I can attest that these units do work well. Um, those are my uh, Mitsubishi units at my cabin in the Catskills. Uh, it was zero degrees and minus uh, negative temperatures uh, over the holidays, and the heat pumps continued to uh, pump heat into the house just, just fine. Uh, so that's what a typical outdoor unit looks like. Um, the indoor units, um, many people are familiar with indoor mini splits or ductless units, uh, which is shown in the center image here. Um, but there are a lot of different styles. There are units that can get recessed into a ceiling or into a wall. Um, there are also multi-split units um, with multiple indoor units connected to a single outdoor unit. Um, and there are ducted units that you can conceal completely and just have uh, traditional ductwork. And in some cases, you can just connect them to the ductwork that you've got in, in the house. Um, so, and one of the nice things about all these indoor units, particularly with the multi-splits, is a uh, great benefit is you can have uh, different indoor units in different rooms and create zones um, so you can have greater comfort comfort um, because each room has its own temperature control. And you can also save energy by uh, setting back the temperature in rooms that you're not using. If you've got guest rooms or whatever, there's nobody in there, you can set those temperatures back. So uh, more comfortable and, uh, and, and save a lot of energy. Um, so here's some typical values. Um, the way we measure efficiency in the cooling mode is the energy efficiency ratio. Uh, and these units typically have an EER of around 15. The seasonal, seasonal energy efficiency ratio is, um, the EER is measured at one precise temperature set of, set of temperature conditions. The seasonal EER takes into account the typical weather in, in, a, in a climate zone. Um, uh, on the flip side of that, it, in uh, heating mode, we use the coefficient of performance to measure the uh, efficiency of the unit. Uh, typically, uh, we have a COP of four at, at 47 degrees with these types of heat pumps. Um, and they've also developed this heating seasonal performance factor, which takes into uh, account the, the typical weather conditions. So New Jersey uh, here, we're in zone four in the southern part of the state and zone five in the northern part of the state. Um, so uh, while it's, uh, we're using this electricity and electricity is obviously cheaper or more expensive than uh, natural gas. But if you're getting four units, if you're only paying for one unit of electricity and you're getting three for free, well, that's a very, very good deal. And I'll tell you, over the past two years, about 20% of the heating systems in Maine have switched from oil to heat pumps, and, and they're working. Um, and I recently helped my son convert his house in Pennsylvania from oil to heat pumps, and his electric bill is a little higher, but he's still saving money because he doesn't have to pay to have his oil tank refilled. So these are very, very efficient, um, and they, they, they work uh, really well and much better than the uh, older style units did. Um, besides 
those air to air heat pumps, we have uh, we can also pump heat from water to air. Um, so if we've got a water system that we as has uh, has energy in it, uh, we can take that energy and pump it into um, into our buildings. Um, and again, the refrigeration cycle um, has a reversing valve, goes into the heating cycle. Um, same principle. On commercial buildings, uh, these are kind of typical um, horizontal vertical water source heat pumps. Um, a lot of these buildings uh, built throughout the throughout the country and throughout the world, and uh, they scale up considerably from the from the residential units into these um, large uh, large tonnage rooftop units, package units. Um, uh, there's a wide variety of systems that that um, are available for this type of application. Um, and the way uh, these systems work in a water source heat pump system is you have a, all these units are connected to a piping loop and the units in heating mode are pulling heat out of that loop. The units in the cooling mode are rejecting heat into the loop. Uh, in the summer, the loop temperature gets too warm. We may need a cooling tower to reject that that heat to keep the loop um, within its limits. And conversely, in the winter, we may need a boiler to add heat to the loop. But in a building that's that's got that's kind of balanced between internal and external zones, um, the units putting heat into the loop balance the units taking heat out of the loop and we recover that energy um, and the boiler stays off the cooling tower stays off and i love things i think the efficiency of something that's off is just one of the most wonderful things in the world so um using the the building uh the the heat that's getting rejected from the building to heat other parts of the building is a is a great strategy now, because of the loop temperatures, um, the EERs and COPs on this type of system are, are better than the air source heat pumps. We go from EERs of 15 up to 18, um, and the COP increases from five to uh, from four up to five to six uh, because we've got lower lift. Um, now, take that same system and instead of connecting it to a boiler and cooling tower, connect it to a bunch of pipes we drill into the ground. And those pipes in contact with the ground keep the loop temperature where it needs to be. So we don't need the boiler, we don't need the cooling tower, and ta-da, we have a geothermal system. Um, the piping uh, is put into the ground, uh, it's a polybutylene piping, or um, um, a high density polyethylene rather. Um, the soil, once you get below the frost line in New Jersey, stays a really relatively constant 55 degrees. Um, so it is a great way to keep um, our loop temperature um, very close to our indoor temperature. So, uh, you know, I just showed you a commercial one. Here's an illustration of a, of a residential one. Um, again, we have because of that constant ground temperature, we have uh, very little lift and therefore great efficiencies. Uh, so some typical values for a ground coupled uh, system. Um, again, our EERs continue to go up. Uh, we're now at um, uh, in the 18 to 22 range. Um, the coefficient of performance doesn't actually loses a little. Um, because of the, the groundwater temperature typically, uh, but that's, uh, those, are, those are still great values and this can be very, very efficient. Uh, take that same type of system and instead of running the plastic pipes in the ground, we can use well water. We can pump well water out of the ground through the heat pumps and reject it back into the ground. So this is one of my favorite and least known systems, but it's an open loop geothermal system. Um, we've got uh, we've got 
commercial buildings like this running for 30, 40 years on this type of system. Um, we've had to replace the, the equipment's worn out, but we're still using the same wells. Um, we've also found this uh, very practical in residential and, and commercial buildings in rural areas uh, where there's no public water system. Uh, you need to drill an, uh, a domestic water well anyway. Well, uh, you know, sink sink another well to return it, and um, and uh, you're there without drilling all the plastic uh, wells into the ground. The hydrology of the site does matter. Um, you do need uh, uh, a water supply um, below the site. So it doesn't work in all locations, but if you've got a decent aquifer, um, it works great. We're um, actually doing a project for the New Jersey DEP um, that has a uh, open loop geothermal system. We're converting it to closed, closed loop um, at the Batstow Mansion um, because the water contains so much iron that it created uh, huge problems for the equipment. Um, so the way the the wells work, the uh, the supply well is a very traditional water well that you'd have in in you know millions of buildings. Um, the one little trick is that you do have to get the water to go back into the ground, um, and it's not going by pressure; it has to go by gravity. So you might need. Uh, a greater, more wells for return than you do for supply. The values here are just astounding. Um, our EERs go up to the 25 to 33 range uh, because the, uh, again, the groundwater is at constant temperature. Um, we've even had, we've had uh, one site where we just ran the well water through um, coils and put it back into the ground. We had no compressors, no heat pumps. Um, the EER on that is something like 2000. It's, it's incredible. Um, so that's uh, uh, another way to, to do that if, you, if, you're, um, if you've got a great uh, location like that. Uh, so you can see as the efficiency increases as we um, minimize the lift and the ground geothermal systems um are, are are a great way to do that all right so that basically covers the heat pumps um the other thing that uh, ken stressed and we want to stress too is uh ventilation when we tighten up a building created a very tight uh uh thermal envelope um and we, we reduce the leakage of the building um we're trapping contaminants inside the building and that's not that's not good. So we need to do um, something to introduce outside air, but outside air can take a lot of energy to heat up or cool. So we want to use the energy of the air already in the building to heat or cool the incoming outside air. So using these uh, energy recovery or heat recovery, energy recovery ventilators, uh, we can, uh, take lots of outside air, pump it into the building, and the energy penalty is really minimal. So um, we're exhausting from uh, bathrooms and kitchens typically uh, to get odor removal as a, in addition to uh, flushing the entire space out. Uh, so this is uh, <clears throat> very important for our um, tightly sealed buildings. Um, and we need this to, we really need to do this for, for indoor health. Um, uh, ASHRAE and other groups have, are also looking at the uh, uh, passive uh, ways of mitigating virus transmission between people um, and outside air is a, is a key uh, way to do that. And for uh, uh, more for commercial buildings where we've got lots of outside air, um, where we've got lots of lots of people in a space, we need to uh, produce uh, or provide more ventilation air. Um, sometimes the outside air can be uh, colder or in the in the winter or more moist, more humidity. 
than the building can really handle. So in the, these cases, we condition that outside air with a dedicated outside air system. Um, this is a, a way of uh, providing outside air to the building without adding to the heating or cooling load of the, of the units themselves. Um, and uh, one of the strongest recommendations from ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration Engineers, is, is to use these units um, uh, to separate the ventilation out from your heating and cooling units. Uh, we got very lazy because it was convenient to um, design units that are heating, ventilating, and air conditioning all in one unit. Well, they it's, you can do a much better job if you separate those functions into separate systems, and this is one way to do that. I guess the quick example uh, of this particular building that I that I um, am fond of, uh, I am partners. We have partners in the Netherlands that designed this building called the Edge in Amsterdam. It was the greenest office building in the world when it was built a few years ago, um, and it has geothermal heat pump systems and has achieved net zero energy use. This is a pretty substantial building to be net zero. Um, and uh, those uh, the Dutch are very uh, smart about, they know a lot about their aquifers. Um, so what they've done is they actually, this is an open loop geothermal system. They actually store warm water um, in the ground in one level of the aquifer in the, in the summer, the heat they're rejecting, so that they can use it in the winter further reducing their the lift of these systems and improving the efficiency. Um, so uh, a, a great example. And Stockton University here in New Jersey has been doing a lot of studies and, and, and research into this type of, of system. So New Jersey has a, has a connection to this um, kind of forward thinking uh, type of application as well. All right, so oh, yep, that's net zero energy. So that's uh, that's what I have. Um, turn it back to Gina. All right, thank you so much, Bill. Um, I do have a few questions that came up for you in the chat. I'm only going to uh, read a few of them out loud because then I really do want to encourage everybody to turn on their cameras and turn on their mics and you know ask those questions that they that they might have typed into the chat or that have come up just because we want to be able to see your faces and hear your voices. Um, but I'm going to ask three uh, just to get the ball rolling here. Um, we have two from Ben Larson. One, he asks, how might we convert an existing steam radiator system to a heat pump system? Uh, I'm wondering if Ben, if this is a setup question, because uh, this is one of my uh, great pet peeves. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it does not lend itself. Um, unfortunately, and, uh, and we've been working with manufacturers and, and all sorts of groups. Um, so a uh, any air to water or water to water heat pump um, currently on the market in the United States can only produce about 140 degrees Fahrenheit supply, um, which is not hot enough to you know, power a steam radiator. Um, now, if you, however, if you do uh, a, a, a deep, deep retrofit, as Ken was talking about, um, uh, and and really reduce the uh, heat load of the building substantially. You could pump 140 degree water through the through the radiators. They'll get warm. They just won't. You know, they throw off a lot less heat than putting steam into them. Okay. Uh, ben also asks, how do we assure we aren't contaminating the aquifers? Um, so they're typically double wall heat exchangers, so the water is not coming in contact with the uh, refrigerants. Um, and uh, the, the refrigerants are really not, um, they're not, there's not enough refrigerant to really uh, cause any damage if it was to leak, but they're, you know, it's almost impossible for the, for the refrigerant to come in contact with that groundwater. Okay. And then 
Claudia Fay asks, is antifreeze or another chemical needed for open loop systems in very cold areas so that the pipes don't split? Uh, not in open loop. Um, open loop systems, because that water is always um, uh, in the ground, um, it's inherently uh, above freezing. In the closed loop systems, we very often do need um, a glycol or a brine uh, to uh, prevent them from freezing because we allow the loop temperature to get down to about 32 degrees um, in the winter. Uh, it would otherwise we'd have to put in a lot more wells um, to keep the loop temperature uh, above freezing and it's it just becomes uh, you know not economically viable to, to do that. Okay. Thank you so much, Bill. All right, again, I really want to encourage for folks to uh, turn on their cameras and turn on their mics. I do see the hands being raised. You can go ahead and uh, turn on your camera, turn on your mic and ask your questions. Um, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Chris. Hey guys, so my, my family and I are here. Sorry, here's my family all watching together. Uh, oh, I see. I have my background thing on. Sorry. Um, so a question for you, not to be too terribly specific so we can be more general to everybody who's listening, but we have an 1860 farmhouse, has original windows, original doors, and an original roof, metal roof. And so I love this, the thing about uh, what you're saying that we don't need to have solar panels on our roof. Question for you. We have uh, fuel oil, uh, boiler, baseboard, hot water, heat. We'd love to change it to something different. We have uh, our hot water off of our boiler. Are there any systems where you can, uh, you know, exchange, change out that system for something that's more efficient? That you have, we get rid of the oil tank. Can we keep our hot water baseboard heat? Would that be like ge geothermal? Would that be the best bet? Thanks. So uh, similar to the steam, um, if if you followed Ken's uh, program for. Uh, reducing the energy use, then you can potentially um, run hot water through your uh, r radiation. Uh, again, you're only going to get 140 degree water as opposed to the 180 degree water. It's not going to put out as much heat, but if you don't need as much heat because you've improved the windows yeah. <laughs> and uh, U-values, then, then that can work. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would just add, um, Bill, you had mentioned the main program with our switching out the oil systems for heat pumps. Um, and so that's certainly, you can just turn it off, your exist, unplug your existing system and in, install air source heat pumps. It requires some intervention, but you, but you would be abandoning the existing system. Right. Um, my question is for uh, Ken. Um, well, I have two, one for Ken and one for William. But uh, so I teach uh, MFBO for the 32BJ union, and I'm wondering if uh, so. We have a, 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 a concept that we say uh, seal it tight, ventilate it right. Uh, we are huge fans of um, the passive house, and I'm wondering if there is um, any incentives towards the insulation of multifamily buildings. Um, that is key, I think, in both what I was hearing from Ken and definitely William, the first step as far as I see it and understand uh, the energy efficiency that we add to any building is ensuring that it's properly sealed. Um, and is are there any incentives out there for the sealing of these multifamily um, buildings? Yeah, great question, Martin. And I'm so we're big fans of 32BJ as well. Uh, right back, Bob Muldoon, who I uh, worked with for years um, there in, in doing some training and programs. Um, uh, the incentives that we've seen, I don't know, well, specifically in New Jersey, I'm not, I could not speak to, unfortunately. I mean, what we typically see is pretty modest. Um, uh, incentives or rebates around weatherization um, that helps improve things. But to go deeper and really re-insulate, um, make it make it properly airtight, um, 
what we've seen is our programs like NYSERDA's Buildings of Excellence program, um, where they're funding and they're focused on multifamily, that program um, for retrofits as well as new building. And it's based on a per unit kind of basis, but um, that's a whole, a whole thing. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. <laughs> so, um, and I, I, I don't, I have notes here somewhere, but I, from even from yesterday, I can't find that. Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act has uh, enhanced um, IRS sections 179, um, 179D, um, which provides uh, a great uh, tax. Uh, don't quote me here. Um, uh, whether it's a tax credit, and I think um, Section 45 um, is uh, also applied to more for residential um, buildings, uh, and the New Jersey Office of Clean Energy um, does have um, programs if you go into, um, well, so Office of Clean Energy has taken um, the programs and, and for existing buildings and pushed them back out to the utilities. New buildings, um, you can still put them through a pay for performance program or custom measures where the uh, insulation values are absolutely um, part of the uh, holistic approach to reducing the energy use. Uh, and they have some very substantial um, incentives. Uh, and, and just the last follow up for you directly, William, is uh, can a heat recovery system uh, be installed in a, again, multifamily building that has 100 percent air set up with no return? Um, absolutely. Um, in fact, it should. And it's almost a code requirement to, to do that now um, that the ex it, there's no return, but there's exhaust. So you've got exhaust out of uh, bathrooms and kitchens. Correct. That should that should be running through a um, uh, either a coil or an energy recovery um, unit um, to preheat that um, incoming combustion air. Okay. The 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 energy code in and so New Jersey adopts the international energy code, which in turn is a copy of ASHRAE's. Uh, standard 90.1, um, and 90.1 has been continually getting more uh, more efficient. Um, so just meeting the code now is is, uh, a, is you're going to be a lot more efficient than you were some years back. Um, problem is we don't have a lot of we it's really no enforcement of the code other than um, someone submitting some paperwork. Um, there's no inspections or anybody checking that they are in fact um, meeting the code on that for the most part here in New Jersey, which is unfortunate. Um, I've just put Thank into the sorry, um, just I've just put into the chat a link to a presentation that uh, Bright Power did, which is a efficiency company in in New York, energy consultant, and. Um, there are a couple of slides in there that speak specifically to some of these insulation re rebates. Um, I couldn't recall them, but yeah, there's there's the cliff notes. Um, Thank you so we much. We also have a uh, present their presentation, which I can drop a link into that presentation as well. Um, That's great. Thank you. I'll also provide these links um, to everybody on the call. I can send an email uh, to all participants and I'll include the links to these presentations in that as well. And thank you, Martin, for your questions. I'll pass it off to. Did Emily have a question, though, first, Kai? Because her camera was on, so I just wanted to make sure. OK. All right, Kai, you're up. <laughs> Hello, I, I'm Kai Osterall, the Bureau Chief for Bureau of Sustainability here at DEP. Uh, thank you, Gina, for the uh, you, you know moderating the session. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, uh, Bill touched on the uh, rebates or the the uh, home energy type of um, programs that the state has through the New Jersey Clean Energy Program. That's done through the Board of Public Utilities. Uh, 
but like he like Bill said, it is pushed back onto the utilities to provide that information. And I just wanted to quick hit a, a share screen here to show you what that kind of would look like. And you know, so this is the PSENG site. Uh, I'm only bringing up PSENG because it's the largest uh, utility in New Jersey. So most people in New Jersey are covered under PSENG, but definitely there's other uh, utility providers. Uh, so you can see that they have like home weatherization programs for in qual income qualified people. Uh, there's also multifamily uh, uh, benefits that you can get for uh, trying to reduce your energy costs in a multifamily building. There's also a home performance for Energy Star and, and things like that. So uh, this is done through the, your respective utility. So do you know where who your energy provider is and go to their website and, and find out what programs are being offered through them? So uh, just to answer uh, more fully the, the one question that the person had specifically about multifamily, but this also applies to all sorts of different energy uh, costs. And I think also the the one person who had the uh, farmhouse, if you try to uh, go through home performance with Energy Star, you can reduce your costs for that uh, insulation projects that you probably would need in order to uh, switch over to something like heat pumps for, for that uh, 1860s farmhouse. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here. I'll throw the link for the public utilities um site that shows you know the different websites for the different electric providers okay thanks so much kai and thank you for sharing that uh with us all because that really is in the spirit of why i like to do the whole turn on your cameras and start <laughs> talking thing because you know sometimes other folks that are at a meeting might have a resource that they want to share and that is something that could get lost during these virtual meetings so that's why you know i like to incorporate this at the end and thank you to everybody that has been turning on their cameras this has been one of the more successful you know end of the meeting q and a's uh i see that one of my colleagues carl has his hand raised carl if you want to go ahead and turn on your camera turn on your mic yep um so if you guys were kings for a day how would you change how uh the incentive dollars were allocated, efficiency programs are run. Um, how do you think we'd be able to get additional traction on some of this, speed the progress, et cetera? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I could jump in. I certainly have my wish list. Um, so to, to us, with new construction, Passive House is a no-brainer. Um, and just make it the building energy code um, and across all, all kinds of use types. So we're seeing it done successfully um, without incentives, just the plain straightforward case. Um, incentives always help sweeten the deal. I think on the retrofit side, which is a huge part of the puzzle, we need to have incentives um, to make it work. We need to close the gap between the costs and to push down. And not to um, steal from Peter to pay Paul. It's not a, we need to do everything. But if, if we were looking at a fiscal limits here, I would love to see some of the emphasis that's placed on on-site renewables um, shifted to efficiency. Um, it, it, it pains me to see the 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 solar rebates are so rich um and homeowners are naturally doing it it's it's actually you know free money in many cases um uh without and we look at the incentives for insulation and air sealing weatherization and deeper retrofits and the money's just not there um so we need to figure out how to pay for that gap ideally it's just more money um but some rebalancing have the renewables at utility scale. No? Yeah, I'd have to, I, I agree with Ken, is that, um, you know, we uh, provided incentives um, for solar and, you know, developers came in and went hog wild on it. Um, we, 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 we don't provide that level of incentive for, uh, for efficiency. Um, so uh, the, the legislation has enacted the, pace 
program, but EDA hasn't issued the rules over two years now. Um, uh, the DCA, um, well, I think it would require legislation for DCA to allow municipalities to adopt uh, stretch codes. Uh, passive house could be a stretch code. There are other, um, you know, uh, more aggressive uh, codes that that could be adopted by municipalities either uh, for uh, redevelopment zones or, um, uh, you know, um, how they could be applied. Um, I think there are a bunch of towns that would uh, love to apply them across the board. Um, and getting the governor and the legislature to stop robbing the Society of Benefits Fund to pay to balance the budget. That money was supposed to all go into the program and it's not. Yeah. Right. And hey, I was just thanks, one, one great example out there um, is Massachusetts has really taken the lead in a lot of ways in building energy efficiency, and they just issued um, new opt-in stretch code for multifamily, and uh, the towns that adopt it uh, for five-story buildings over a certain size, I think it's 12,000 square feet, up to five stories this year. Uh, certified passive house is mandatory. It's not... Um, you could also do it through a Teddy score, but basically passive house is the end result. Um, and and next year it will be a five and above. Um, these towns, the stretch code of Massachusetts is adopted by the vast majority of the towns. And right now, Cambridge and Somerville and Watertown and Brookline have all adopted um, this opt-in stretch code. And it's kind of like a watershed moment, it feels like, in terms of of pushing the market. Just, just you, for, for, for perspective, codes codes are um, designed to be the the lowest the lowest com the lowest limit where you won't die. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that's they have to justify re their requirements to be, you know, that you know people will this is not good for people, so you have to require this. Um, as opposed to lead um, or, or passive house of the, of the stretch codes, is that these are best practices. Why would we be building and not applying best practices? It just doesn't make sense. We know better, um, and and we should, but we have to get um, you know, it, it's a combination of education and incentivizing. Thank you both for your answers and thank you, Carl, for the question. For those of you who don't know Carl, you can always count on him for an out of the box thinking, out of the box question. So that was great. Um, we only have a few more minutes left um, in our meeting, uh, but we do have a hand raised from uh, Gus. Gus, if you want to turn on your camera and mic, you can be our last question of the day before we conclude this meeting. Oh boy. Hi. Hello all. Um, it's, it's the last question of the day. That puts a lot. I, I let me say one or two things before I ask my question. Um, uh, it, it, you talk about solar and the solar assistance in New Jersey. You really have two programs, re residential and commercial. Um, you'll see in the numbers and if you go, I think the BPU is doing a presentation tomorrow. You can go check that out. You'll see that the commercial solar sector in this state is in terrible circumstance. And obviously, um, we're referring to the, the um, TREC, the TREX program, which was generous. Um, I'm with a, the uh, trade association, um, Mid, Mid Atlantic States <coughs> Solar and Storage. And we track this stuff because it's our lifeblood. Um, it, it, and the residential's doing fine. Uh, commercial is in big, big trouble. Um, and it's because they cut in half, in half, previously provided. So the, the book is still, the, the jury's still out on whether the BPU knows how to do commercial solar or is interested in supporting it. Um, and uh, I just needed to make that clarification because a lot of people lump the residential and the commercial together, even in national discussions and in separate industries. Um, I uh, I uh, really enjoy. Was it, it 
thanks to everyone participating. My question goes to Ken. Um, you had spoken earlier uh, embedded, which you embedded costs of uh, these uh, improvements, uh, building improvements, what, what, whatever program or style they come from. is embedded stuff and glass and steel and all these good things that we probably didn't use as we were building stupid buildings. Now to build a good building, you're right, there are, it, it, uh, relies heavily on carbon generating materials. You would, is there a percentage that you use as a rule of thumb? Is I mean, how bad is that? Just, just how much <laughs> more damage do we do? I mean, can you say, oh, it's 3% damage when we go with a, uh, a smart, uh, a smart, yeah, um, I don't have a uh, uh, answer off the off the cuff for you, unfortunately. What I okay. would say is a couple of things. One, um, the um, uh, what we see if you have a, a existing building that's steel and masonry, concrete, like something of sub some substance, not a not necessarily a stick build, you know, single family home. Uh, that's existing structure. You could probably save about 50% of the embodied carbon um, that, uh, you know, you would otherwise have to do because concrete and steel, steel can come from a lot of recycled material now and the carbon profile has gone down a lot. Concrete is probably the single biggest issue. So the less concrete we use, uh, the more sustainable it is pretty much across the board um, uh, and and so on. I don't know. It's a good question what the, the payback is. I know there's tremendous focus because not only is there embodied carbon in many of these materials from the production and processing and, and maintenance, but we actually have options where we can pick materials like you see the growth of mass timber. Um, you grow, see the growth of... Um, uh, natural insulation materials um, where you can sequester carbon and actually capture carbon and give the construction a negative carbon profile. So it's theoretically a net benefit. I mean, it's still, you know, the construction workers are still driving to the job site, which is ironically probably the single biggest carbon footprint of a building is the construction uh, construction workers driving to it, certainly in a place where, you know, they're driving an hour one way. Uh, Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Who would have yeah, thought? Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of ingredients there, but there's a lot of great work. And like RMI is doing uh, a lot of work on embodied carbon now. There's a guy, Chris Magwood, out of Canada, who's done a lot. And we're, um, we've actually created a embodied carbon accounting tool that goes plugs into the passive house energy model so right. that you can calculate the the carbon emissions um, as well as the embodied carbon so i should be able to just flick a switch and have an answer for you but i, I don't I'll, I'll I'll quick answer. That up. Uh, way, if i could just put an addendum on new jersey to get adopted by the state for the past 10 years, right? Some people never, um, it, it come through and is uh, said that it's it's been held up for reasons at the EDA, because it's such a dynamite program. Everything that's been discussed today can be financed through PACE. Is, it is the way to be financed, that's the, that's the program. And you can, it was designed truly to allow for virtually anything that can be roughly claimed or finance that it's a there's the broadest definition of any program in the country so um it, it will be a big stimulus it's the best financing available ever um and we just Know that there are a lot of good people here on the call today from the Department of Environmental Protection. So please call your sisters and brothers over and tell them to get the program out. Um, it's you, you can 
and I've worked for state I've worked for state agencies. I, I know the relationships. It's time for the EDA to to put the put the regs out. You sorry to jump in. Okay. And Bill looks he has I, his hand I, raised, I, so I think he I needs, just, has the final comment for the day. Okay. Yeah. So just just uh, you know, I think it was about two weeks ago, New Jersey, I believe the first state in the in the country to pass a uh, a low carbon concrete um, incentive program. Mm -hmm. Good. So, um, yep. yes. So, um, uh, yeah, so we can be we can be proud of that. We're we're leading the country in at least uh, 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 recognizing um, the carbon content of concrete and trying to do something about it. That's fabulous. That's great news. Great. Thank you now both get, for speaking today and thank you everybody for your <laughs> questions. We are a few minutes uh, past our closing time, so we are going to conclude today's meeting. Um, but I will take any unanswered Q&A and I will share them with Ken and Bill. Hopefully uh, we might get, you know, some answers trickling in after, but I don't want to keep everybody too long after the conclusion time of this meeting. Um, but it has been really great. I thank you all for joining us. A special thanks again to Bill and Ken. This was awesome. Uh, a posting of a recording of this meeting will be shared on the S3 webpage, and I hope to see you all again at our next S3 meeting. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.